Hello from National Geographic Education. My name is Gina Borgia and this is Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we use the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. Explorer Classroom connects students worldwide with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and time for your questions. This school year, each month will be organized around a specific theme. And this September, Explorer Classroom will be exploring different ecosystems and the importance of conservation. Today, our guests are Rob Taylor and Vladi Russo. Rob is an ecologist from Southern Africa who is very fond of aquatic plants and invertebrates. He loved growing up in a provincial park where his father worked, and that love continues to help protect African wilderness today, especially rivers and the wildlife there. And Vladi is a storyteller from Angola, a country in Southern Africa, who is very interested in environmental education. He has written stories for children and adults to help them better understand Angola's environmental environment and biodiversity. Together, Rob and Vladi are part of a team helping to protect the Okavango River Basin. This is a huge expanse of wilderness across many countries in the southern parts of Africa, where people, animals, and habitats depend on a healthy river basin to survive and thrive. So today, Rob and Vladi will share why this river basin is important to protect and how special it is, not just to Southern Africa, but to the world. Before we get into today's lesson, I'd like to welcome everybody who is registered and who join us today from around the globe. And we have special shout outs for Central Woodlands Grade School in Michigan, Toluca Lake Elementary in California, Cochicalco High in Mexico, Rutland Middle School in Canada, and all of our homeschools out there. We are so thrilled to have you here. And with that, let's get this Explorer Classroom started. It's time to turn it over to Rob and Vladi to share all about conserving the Okavango River Basin. Take it away, Rob. Thank you, Gina. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you. Let me share my screen quickly. And um, all right, so this, uh, this is me. And when I'm on expedition, I, I almost always have a net in my hand and I'm out catching insects or fish or frogs or anything. Um, but a little bit of background about me. I grew up in uh, Isimangaliso Wetland Park, which is a World Heritage Site right in the south um, of Africa. You can see that little pink dot. And my dad was the ecologist there. And uh, growing up, I always wanted to be just like my dad and be an ecologist. And every weekend, I'd be out helping him uh, with field work. Uh, and I'd love catching things. I would always be out catching, uh, here I'm catching a crab, but I'd always uh, often take my mom's sieve. You can see the sieve in the mud there, and she could never bake because the sieve was always covered in mud. Um, and then as I grew up, I went to university. I studied ecology. Ecology is, uh, is the study of uh, all the, the aspects of the ecosystems which and how they um, interact and link together. Ecosystems being everything within a system, all the living things, the plants and the animals and all the non-living things, the soil and the water and the climate and weather. Um, and then, yeah, here um, I am today still catching things. He has a little fish that I've caught and I work for the National Geographic Okavango Wilderness Project. So this is an incredible photograph taken by a And in the middle of the screen, you can see this huge wetland. And that wetland is the Okavango Delta. It's got two main rivers that um, flow into it. Uh, they start right up in the north uh, in a country called Angola. And they flow through Angola, through a country called Namibia, and then down all the way into a country, Botswana, where I am living and working.
that on the the picture on the left, that little pink dot, that's uh, where I am sitting right now at the sort of southernmost extent of the Okavango Delta. So the National Geographic Okavango Wilderness Project, has, we we run expeditions on all the rivers feeding the Okavango and the uh, the rivers going through the Okavango Delta itself. We use these boats, we call them Makoro. And these boats we use as our transport on expedition. And we have, we pull them with these long poles that um, we use to pull down the river. We can fill these boats up with up to 500 kgs of research equipment and food and camping equipment. And this allows us to be self-sufficient and we can go out for months on expedition. We camp underneath the stars and we cook our food on fires. It's, uh, yeah, it's absolutely lovely being out and a privilege to be out in this vast wilderness. On these expeditions, we have a small team of, of scientists. They are ecologists like myself. They're hydrologists, people who study water, entomologists, people who study insects, uh, and others, other scientists. We want to understand more about the ecosystems of the Okavango. We want to understand this so we can better conserve the Okavango. And we want to conserve the services that these ecosystems provide. So some of these services include food. Uh, fish is a very important protein. A lot of the people living near the, the Okavango rely on fish for, for food, but they're also uh, vegetables that are plants that are edible. Then building materials, there's lots of reeds that can be used for building houses, clean fresh drinking water, which uh, you, we drink the water straight from the river because it filters through the landscape and so the most beautiful clean water. And then tourism is very important. People travel from around the, across the globe to see this beautiful landscape. Um, and then uh, last is uh, carbon storage. So we all know that the Global climate change is a big problem, and uh, carbon emissions uh, are contributing to this climate change. And these huge wetlands store vast amounts of carbon, so it's a very important uh, that that we preserve these wetlands and and the carbon that they store. Now I want to. This is a question for everyone. What makes an ecosystem. And in your chat bar, you should be able to um, just type in of these pictures, you can choose a letter of as many as you want. Uh, and if you can just type in A, B, or C, or which or, or A and B or A and E, what of these these pictures is part of an ecosystem? So obviously that the big hippo there, hippos, they're definitely part of our ecosystem. And what about this apex D, apex predator of a, is a crocodile? And B, weather. So all of these things, all of these are building blocks for an ecosystem. They all form an ecosystem. So we've got the plants, the, the birds, and then the invertebrates and the insects, everything here together makes the ecosystem. Um, and I want to focus particularly on those invertebrates. Um, so why do we catch these bugs when we go out? And the reason is that a lot of other creatures rely on these small invertebrates because they are the, their staple food. And 
within the Okvango Delta, there are thousands of different species. This tiny little um, beetle at the tip of the dropper, it's the size of a, um, just bigger than a pinhead. It's, it's a very small little beetle. Um, but if you, I'll give you, show you some of these, the, the invertebrates that we found. This is a, a giant diving beetle. And look at those ferocious mandibles and they hollow, they hollow because they don't have a mouth. So what they do is when they catch their prey, they inject their prey with a digestive enzyme that breaks up and makes it all jelly-like. And then they can slurp up the prey through the hollows of their, of their mandibles so that uh, just like you would slurp a, a milkshake. Uh, this is a back swimmer. He feeds on the surface of the uh, of the of the uh, water, um, hence the name back swimmer. He's swimming on his on his back and just eating all the insects. Uh, this is a creeping water bug. This is a tiny little water mite, uh, a dragonfly larvae. Uh, dragonflies are incredible. They start off their life completely underwater, ferocious predators, and then they uh, when they get big enough, they crawl out and um, hatch into a dragonfly that we all know with the big wings. Now this is a giant water bug. And this is a dad or going to be a dad. He's got, um, the, the female has laid her eggs on his back and he looks after the eggs uh, until they hatch. He protects them from predators. He even um, uses his hind legs to, to filter fresh water over them to, to keep them nicely aerated. Oh. Um, there's a water snail, a mosquito larvae, there's a damselfly, and all of these together, they're all part of this ecosystem. And as soon as you have a threat to the ecosystem, is it pollution or loss of habitat, you start to lose these species. And if you lose too many of them, the ecosystem can collapse. So that's why we are, are, are monitoring the invertebrates um, as we paddle down the rivers. But I want to suggest that not everyone, that it doesn't have to be a specialist or an ecologist to, to look at these invertebrates and, and look at the health of your system. And that if you go and take your, a net or a sieve from the kitchen uh, and then go to your a local wetland or river, you too can scoop and see what um, invertebrates you can catch. Maybe take a jar and then you can put some of these invertebrates into the jar and take it to show your teacher and together you can try and identify what you've caught. And there's a cool app that you can use. It's called Seek. And Seek allows you to take a photo. Um, you can then, uh, you, here's an example. I'm looking, what is this? What's it look? Oh, I found a dragonfly. You can see it's starting to identify this. I identified it now as a violet dropwing. It'll then give you information about that. Uh, and there's also all sorts of fun challenges uh, for you to go out and do. So my take home is I hope that you can all go out and whether it's to a local river or even in your backyard, see what you can catch and find and identify. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob, for that presentation. All right, let's turn it over to Vladi. It's your turn. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon for you. It's good evening for me here in Angola. It's almost uh, um, half past seven. Um, so let me share my screen um, so you can see my presentation. As was indicated in the beginning, I'm in Angola. It's a country uh, in the southern part of the African continent. I do um, <clears throat> write stories for children. Um, this picture that I'm showing you now, the water cycle is part of a, a book about two kids that they live you know, up in the mountains that you can see here uh, on, the, on the springs. And then they want to go and visit the sea because they've not been there. But um, yeah, anyway, so um, this is about, as, as Rob said, about the protection of this wonderful area, the Okavango River Basin, where you have lots of rivers producing lots of water and feeding thousands of, of people. And what I want to share with you is 
um, the water cycle. I'm sure you are very familiar with this uh, water cycle where we have the rain, I mean, the, the water you know, flowing from a spring, from, from the mountains, going through different valleys and then ending up um, in the ocean. So, and then it evaporates, transforms from liquid to, uh, to, to gas, I mean, to, 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 to rain in those clouds that you can see over there. And then it rains again and the cycle continues. So that's, that's the normal water cycle that most of you have learned in, in, in sciences. But for this particular area, we do have the river flowing directly to the sand. It doesn't go into a estuary, doesn't go into a river mouth. So it's a very particular situation, very different from what you would normally uh, would see. And, and we, we say that our, our river system um, goes from source to sand because it ends up in an area in Botswana that is called the Okavango Delta, which is a World Heritage Site. Uh, so I'm going to take you in a bit of a journey through this river system. The river is 1,000 miles long, so it's, it's quite a, a long river. And um, this one with different other rivers coming together to provide water for, for people. So I'm just going to show you, you know, this is how it looks like. You've seen some of the uh, photos that uh, Rob has shared. You can see the vastness of the area. It's quite big. Uh, you can lose sight of the trees there, uh, but there are lots of areas with, with, with water and it's water all over the place. And then if we zoom in you know, and you can see here, and maybe it's not very clear, but a few wildlife there. So we've got lots of animals there from the small creatures that Rob has mentioned to you, to you know, big animals like the elephants, the, the hippos, the crocodiles, and the leopards. I mean, there are lots of the lions. I'm sure you're very familiar with the with the lion, lion king, uh, and lots of animals that depend on this system as well as people. So if we zoom in a little bit, then I can show you. You can see here the mokoros that uh, Rob has mentioned. They are going, uh, you know, down the the river, paddling through the through these channels. Um, as part of the expeditions to learn about different species, the aquatic invertebrates, uh, the vegetation there, the birds, uh, the big mammals. You know, it's it's a, a very rich area. And those scientists, those explorers are going down the river, you know, taking notes of water quality, et cetera, so we can better understand the system and come up with tools to protect. So let's zoom in a little bit more. So you can see now you are you know, very close to the river. You can actually feel the water, feel the, uh, the grass uh, on, the, on the river bank. So you've got people that depend on water going down the river, using the river to transport uh, goods, some of them to go to see a doctor, uh, some to go and see family because they're very close friends there, although it's long distances, but they use these mokoros and other um, canoes uh, dugout canoes that they construct, construct to build out of the trees for them to use as a uh, means of communication. Uh, and then I'll zoom in a little bit more so you can see a couple here very happy paddling along the, 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 the river, you know, taking firewood for they, so they can cook their meals. And it's just to show you that they really depend on that ecosystem. If they don't have the water there, if they don't have the firewood there, if they don't have the wildlife there, they will starve. So they need all these resources that are part of these ecosystem services, the services that ecosystem provides uh, to all human beings, and they rely a lot on that. So, but it's not only the couple here, you know, the adults, but we also have kids, you know, um, young teenagers that they also, you know, take a lift uh, and, and use the Mokoros also for transportation to go and see the doctor, to go to school. Uh, so they live and breathe water all the all the time uh, in that particular um, area of, of the country, uh, of the region, of these three countries. What is very curious about this Okavango River system is that it, it, the name of the river keeps on changing as you move across the borders. Um, you can see, you know, the river going, you know, zigzagging, as we say it here in, in Angola. It starts in the highlands of Angola, uh, and, and when it starts, it's called the Kubango, as you can see here written there. And then as it goes, you know, moves south, you know, towards the Namibia border, when it crosses the Namibia border, gets another name, Kavango. And then when it gets to, to Botswana, it's another name, it's Okavango. So it's known, you know, you will know the Okavango Delta, where it's 
actually ends on that magnificent uh, view that you see there. So it's it's part of the culture of the people that to give names to rivers, to give names, local names to, to, to trees, to give names to local um, animals. And it's it's part of the culture of those people also to protect. And then we need to help them to protect. And uh, how do we do that? We learn about things, we do research, we try to understand the interaction between the ecosystem, the species within ecosystems, our role as human beings in protecting uh, uh, this ecosystem, or in some cases, some people um, causing pollution and degrading the ecosystem. And then why is it important uh, really to protect these? Why should we protect these uh, water sources? I mean, they we call them the water tower of Southern Africa, of all these regions. Southern Africa is composed of 14 countries, at least, you know, 12 countries, they rely heavily on this uh, 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 water. And then it's important really to protect because it collects all the water, you know, all the water that comes from different other rivers, from different other sources, from the springs, from, from a, a, an area upstream that we call the source lakes. And then it collects water and then distributes the water all the time. Throughout the years, you keep on having water. Of course, with climate change, there are a bit of changes there, but uh, the system is still uh, quite pristine and, 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 and providing water to all um, human um, beings there and other, and other species. Uh, it's also because there is very special people that uh, could preserve this environment for many years. People have been living there for so many years um, and they will continue to live, but we need them to live in a healthy environment. And because as you've seen for some of the photos that we've shown, it's really a unique place for plants and wildlife. Uh, it's a very beautiful environment. As Rob said, we have people coming from other parts of the world, from America even, to come to Southern Africa, to come to this spot, to visit and uh, get to know this area. So for all these reasons, we believe it's really important uh, to make effort to protect that uh, unique ecosystem in the whole world. Thank you. Back to you, Gina. Wonderful. Keep it exciting, changing it up all the time. <laughs> well, I have one last question for you both before we end the show today, but do you have any general advice for all of the young explorers out there that you'd like to share with them before we go? Start with you, Rob. Yeah, uh, just if you, if, if it's your, your dream to become an explorer or an ecologist or, or anything like that. I, I think volunteering is always a brilliant thing uh, to do, uh, is to volunteer and get experience in, in the fields that you want to, to, to go into. Um, and or if and go out and play in the catch catch things in the river or in the bush or everything it's just yeah i don't know that's what i do <laughs> that's what i love yeah yeah for my side is really uh, you know follow your dreams follow your your passion if you are passionate about something learn about it and work on it and learn and share with everyone you know take a camera Go outside, you know, as, as Rob said, grab grab a few you know pictures and try to identify, or just you know take pictures, share the the, the beauty of, it, of the nature, you know, the good thing that you have around us. And um, but you know, if if you have a dream, pursue it, you know, go go for it, you know. And because uh, uh, when the dream comes true, you'll be very really very happy that you 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 did go for that specific route. Sometimes that you know those dreams to achieve are hard but uh, it's, it's always good to follow our dreams and our aspirations. Thank you both for that fabulous advice. And thank you again, Rob and Vladdy for being with us here today, taking the time out of your busy schedule to present to us about the amazing work that you're doing. So we, we really thank you and appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, it's been lovely being here, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Absolutely. And a big thank you to all of the students and teachers for joining. We hope that you join many more of our events. 
Our next event for this age group will be on October 6th. We'll join explorer Jens Bonaire to hear all about the importance of the Bio Bio River in Chile and why he considers it part of his family. You won't want to miss this. Another great episode about the importance of conservation. And next Wednesday, October 5th, join us for the second event in our special series live from the exploration vessel Nautilus during its expedition in the Hawaiian Islands. This is in partnership with the Ocean Exploration Trust and will be joined by the shark team on the ship led by National Geographic explorer Ariana Santos to learn all about Hawaii sharks and how their research can help inform the conservation efforts in that area. And teachers, if you register for more than one event in that series, that special series with the Ocean Exploration Trust, you have a chance to win a special prize for your classroom. So go ahead and register for this event and many more at natgeoed.org slash explore classroom. You can request a chance to be featured on screen with us during the registration process. And fellow teachers, we've also created a new interactive guide for you to share with your students. Take them on a learning journey with each of our special guests. You can find the Explore Mindset in Action Guide and the Teacher Edition linked on the registration page for each event. And we're also sending that in the chat for you now. So have a great day, everyone. Stay curious, keep exploring, and we'll see you next time on Explorer Classroom. Bye-bye.